Hey everyone, God bless you and thanks a lot for tuning in. I have a reflection for your edification today that I have entitled Heresy. I'm thinking about heresy uh, because I have just finished a six-week series in the St. John Chrysostom Catechetical School in my parish dedicated to St. Paul's pastoral epistles. These are the letters that he wrote to his spiritual sons, the archpastors, Saints Timothy and Titus, and these texts are jam-packed with St. Paul's exhortation to his spiritual sons uh, to guard the faith, uh, to treasure and teach the faith, uh, using his words to St. Titus. He says to uh, exhort, to constantly exhort in sound doctrine, and to refute those who contradict. So he, he addresses the subject of false teaching and the subject of heresy in multiple places, uh, in these uh, pastoral epistles. So it's a bit on my mind. Plus, we're on the cusp. We Orthodox Christians are on the cusp of uh, Great Lent. And the culmination of the first week of Great Lent, the first Sunday of Great Lent, is called the Sunday of Orthodoxy. And this is the Sunday in which the Church commemorates uh, the defense of the faith, especially uh, the triumph of Orthodoxy, uh, in the ninth century against the long-standing 150-year succession of uh, heretical teachings with regards to iconography. But on this occasion, of course, we also address very clearly uh, the subject of heresy. So with that uh, as the stimuli for my thinking, I'd like to say a few things to you about heresy, what it is, how the church understands it, Right off the bat, however, since we live in a, a culture of relativism, or we might even call it, as did the late Pope Benedict XVI, a, a dictatorship of relativism, in which the only heresy is believing that there is such a thing as heresy. That's the only thing many uh, postmoderns actually think is, uh, is worthy of the appellation heresy. Because we, we swim in this... Uh, cultural milieu of relativism, it's very, very important for we who love God and believe in truth to understand what heresy is, not to uh, conform to the pressures of our culture, and at the same time not to go the other way and treat heresy like uh, with a, a, a casual uh, and irreverent stroke. Uh, using it as a verbal bomb against those that we disagree with. That's grotesque. But to have a sober reflection, an appreciation for uh, the gravity of heresy, understanding what it is and what a Christian should think about it and how to relate to it. So hear me out for a few minutes, will you, about uh, heresy and its meaning and how to relate to it. This word heresy, eresis, in the scriptures is very common. It has a broad semantic range uh, in the Holy Bible. In the Old Testament, the word means choice. It means choice. It's used in the Old Testament in many different ways, such as uh, in a reference to free will offerings, which are described in the 22nd chapter of the third book of Moses called Leviticus as, quote, gifts according to their choice, their heresis. In Hellenism, the word heresy or heresis describes various teachings of various philosophical schools, so kind of traditions of uh, belief. Judaism used the word in the same kind of neutral way, uh, merely in a descriptive way, until the second century AD, when it began to be used by ra rabbis together with its Hebrew equivalent uh, to evaluate and castigate Christians like us and Gnostics. So it took on this pejorative, very negative connotation at this time in the second century and its use by uh, Jews. The New Testament itself uses eresis very commonly uh, in many different passages. So as an example, Acts chapter 24, St. Paul is before Felix and he says that the Jews malign the way of Christ by calling it a sect. And he uses the word eresis to describe this. It is a sect, uh, and Paul considers this to be a vicious slander by the Jews. 
In some cases, the word is employed with the same neutral meaning as in the first century usage in both uh, Judaism and Hellenism. But in the history of the church, it developed a pejorative negative connotation and meaning from the very beginning. Besides the meaning choice, it, it can also mean a chosen opinion. So it can still be used that way, uh, especially in its negative sense. For instance, Second Peter, St. Peter in his second epistle, chapter 2, verse 1, des describes uh, heresies as, uses this word to describe destructive opinions, negative and destructive opinions. So these uh, definitions, these three basic choice, sex, and, or negative destructive opinions, these three definitions are united in the church's theological understanding of what heresy is. The true faith is revealed to us by our Lord Jesus Christ through his holy body, the church. When it comes to choice for an Orthodox, the only choice that uh, a Christian has that's legitimate is to accept the faith once delivered to the saints, received, guarded, preserved, and propagated by the church of the Lord, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. That's our choice. We don't have a choice of to take the faith and uh, divide it into pieces. Well, this part we choose to accept and this part we choose to reject, right? What people might call cafeteria Christians. Oh, I will take this, but I won't take that. That is uh, heretical. It is the misuse of choice. Our choice is to receive the faith or not, to be believers and children of the church or not. This is our way. The appellation heretic and the word heresy are used by the Holy Fathers, and this is an important point, point both to describe heresies that have arisen within the church, which is its normative usage, and also to describe false teachings, erroneous teachings of false Christian teachers who are outside the church, some who have never ever been in the church. This is also a legitimate and traditional use of the word heretic and heresy. For instance, the church fathers used the word heresy to describe the pagan te teaching of Manichaeanism, which never arose from the church, arose outside the church. Also to describe Jewish errors. Also to describe um, Protestant heresies, for instance. It's not true that the word heresy is only used in the Orthodox tradition to describe errors that have arisen within the church herself as though it were inappropriate to describe uh, later heresies that never had any organic connection to the church like the Protestant heresies uh, did not have. Our Holy Fathers have always described Protestantism as a collection of heresies even though Protestantism never had any organic connection to uh, Holy Orthodoxy. There are many very powerful passages in the New Testament, both in the Gospels and the Epistles, uh, that describe heresy and heretics, the, the rise and impact of heresies, and how Christians ought to relate to these. I'm not going to uh, dive into those, but I will refer to them so you can research these, such as Jesus is teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 15, where he warns us against false teachers. Matthew chapter 24, this is Jesus's great eschatological discourses where he prophesies the rise of her heretics and false teachers. Uh, the Acts of the Apostles, of course, has many references to heresies, one that's developed quite uh, a lot and is referred to by the Holy Fathers often comes from Acts chapter 20, verses 28 to 30, where St. Paul prophesies the rise of wolves, false heretical teachers uh, in the church in Ephesus that will arise from within the church itself. It's a very powerful text. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 19, where St. Paul describes the necessity for, in God's providence, heresies and schisms to arise so that the faithful uh, can um, see who are the faithful leaders and affix, affix themselves to those who are true and faithful. Of course, uh, St. Paul, in his listing of works of the flesh, as he mentions fruits of the Spirit, he also describes works of the flesh in Galatians 5. And one of the works of the flesh he describes as uh, heresies and schisms. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there's much teaching about this in the pastoral epistles, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. In 1st Timothy, heresies are called the doctrines of demons. That is the title of uh, an extensive series I did on heresy that's available uh, on PNP on our website. You can Download those lectures if you'd like. And also from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, where he writes that the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, 
but according to their own desires in order to have their ears tickled because they have itching ears. They will heap up for themselves teachers in accord with their own desires. They will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables, as well as 2 Peter chapter 2 and 3. Both of those chapters have a lot of teaching on this. It's all over the New Testament. That's my point. So as uncomfortable as it is uh, often to think about heresy, to speak about heresy, to watch for heresy in ourselves and to extract it, to reject it, or from the outside, the concept, the teaching permeates the Holy Scriptures and also the writings of the Holy Fathers. The great Saint Irenaeus of Lyon in his third century against heresies text writes this. He goes, it is incumbent to obey the priests who are in the church, those who, as I have shown, possess the succession from the apostles. These men, together with the succession of the bishops, have received the certain gift of truth according to the good pleasure of the Father. But we should hold in suspicion others who depart from the primitive succession and assemble themselves together in any place whatsoever, either as heretics of perverse minds or as schismatics puffed up and self-pleasing. Or they may be hypocrites, acting this way for the sake of money and vain glory. For all of those persons have fallen from the truth. The heretics bring strange fire to the altar of God, namely strange doctrines. So they shall be burned up by the fire from heaven, as were Nadab and Abihu. Remember these sons of Aaron in the Old Testament who uh, offered strange fire, fire that had not been commanded or revealed by God, and fire came out from the altar and consumed them. Very, very frightening uh, text, Leviticus chapter 10. So the scriptures and the church fathers dedicate a lot of important instruction for our salvation to the subject of heresy and how to relate to it. And of course, if you're going to be preparing yourself to be on the Sunday of Orthodoxy service, the first weekend of Great Lent, you're going to participate, of course, in the celebration of Orthodoxy and the triumph of Orthodoxy over heresy. And we will carry our icons outside at the conclusion of the liturgy and encircle the church. And then we will read the Synodicon of Orthodoxy, both wishing many years to the defenders of Orthodoxy, commemorating the great fathers and church of the church who defended the faith against heresy, and also anathematizing those who have uh, taught heresy in the church. And we all, in a responsorial way, will liturgically uh, reject heresy. Interestingly, when I was becoming Orthodox, just before I made my final commitment to be enrolled as a catechumen, I went to see a very venerable Presbyterian elder who had been a missionary for something like 70 years, 65 or 70 years. Uh, I respected him deeply. He was 90 years old and a kind of the veteran uh, Presbyterian minister. I went to see him uh, to, or in order to have tea and to tell him, to reveal my heart to him, what I was going to do. That I, as a, as a young man uh, in my mid-twenties, was going to leave uh, the Presbyterian upbringing and education that I had received and become an Orthodox Christian. And I, I wanted, I knew, I was nervous to do it. I was very nervous to do it. But I, I really wanted to share it with him. I felt that I, it would be beneficial to me to hear what he had to say. So I met with him and I told him all the reasons. My fear of, of that I was believing heresies, my lack of confidence in the authenticity and sustainability of uh, our Protestant faith. And I shared with him very humbly but in great detail. And then I asked him for his opinion. And I was not prepared for what he, what he said. I was not prepared at all for it. He told me first that he, was, he knew what orthodoxy was and that when he had been a Protestant missionary in Russia, he said, uh, they anathematized me. I had no idea what he was talking about until I became Orthodox and participated in the Sunday of Orthodoxy. He, in fact, as a missionary, had gone to a liturgy in Lent and had heard... Um, Protestantism being anathematized by the Russian Orthodox bishops and priests. He also looked at me, and this greatly impacted me, and he said, I understand what you're saying and how you're thinking. And then he kind of looked off and he said, if only I was younger. Deeply, deeply impacted me. 
So let me sum up, dear ones, about the, the origins and characteristics of heresy for you to have this in your mind. Number one, the Orthodox Catholic faith of the Christians was once for all delivered to the saints, revealed, whole, pure. Number two, heresy is a parasitical innovation, an alteration of the true faith, and is always incoherent and deficient. It's reductionistic, which is expressed in its being named often after its founder. Lutheranism, Calvinism, Arianism, Nestorianism, etc. Number three, heresy is almost always a deliberate deviation from the apostolic norm due to sin. Common motivations, the fathers say, are a love of the new. That's very much a root of heresy today. The love of the new, discontent, pride, indiscreet curiosity, saying too much, love of power, and greed, especially greed for ecclesiastical office, the fathers say. And number four, heresy develops under the providence of God and is the fulfillment of New Testament prophecies. Christians should not be surprised nor scandalized by the appearance of heresies and should accomplish God's work in opposing them in ourselves, in our own hearts and minds, in our families, amongst those that we're near. This work includes the love of the heretic and efforts at his or her recovery, as well as the acknowledgement of and affixation to those leaders of the church who are approved. Why is heresy so bad, dear ones? Because heresy does not save. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Truth, Jesus, the truth, saves. Heresy separates us from our attachment to Christ because we're being bound to something that is not true. Let's make sure that we hold to the faith, that we accept the faith once delivered to the saints and preserved in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Let's make sure we hold to the faith and that we reject heresy. And let us priests and bishops, let me say a word just to you, uh, my brother priests and revered bishops, especially to heed the words of St. Paul to his spiritual son, St. Titus, to exhort faithfully in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. A blessed Sunday of Orthodoxy to all of you this next weekend. And may God keep us in the faith. God be with you. Patristic Nectar Publications is pleased to announce a new conference entitled The Sacred Arts, Preaching the Gospel Without Words, with lectures given by Father Maximus Konstas and Jonathan Pajot. From Friday, March 29th to Sunday, March 31st, conference topics will include The Origin of Sacred Art, How Iconography Preaches the Gospel, How to Read an Icon, how Architecture Preaches the Gospel, How Music Preaches the Gospel, and a sermon by Father Maximus. We hope you will join us for opportunities to pray, meet our speakers, attend a young adult social hour, and network with like-minded individuals. A $60 registration fee includes an in-person seat, access to a live stream which can be viewed from anywhere, and the conference recordings. To register and find more information, please visit conference.patristicnectar.org